Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, very special program, a celebration of the renowned Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal. And it also marks the grand finale of a month of programming at the main library in celebration of National Poetry Month. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a couple upcoming poetry programs. On behalf of the Public Library, we want to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards, and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working here. We wish to acknowledge the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush to pay our respects and to affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples. As uh, some of you know, we have a regular poetry reading uh, the second Thursday of each month. This is moderated by San Francisco poet laureate Emerita Kimshuk. Um, the program in May, May 9th, will feature several Bay Area poets laureate, uh, past and present, including Georgina Marie Guardado, Kimi Sukioka, and Brenda Yeager. And on June 13th, the program will feature writers associated with the multicultural lesbian journal, Sinister Wisdom. So I hope you will come back to those events. We have flyers advertising events here at the library on the table, as well as the newsletter. Help yourself to those, as well as to homemade cookies. And there's coffee also. Uh, you can also find out about programs by visiting our website at sfpl.org and consulting the online events calendar there. So that's, that is more or less my announcements. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn the microphone over to one of the editors of the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, Alice Rogoff. Please give a warm welcome to Alice. The readers in this uh, event tonight are the readers in this event tonight are local writers who are in our a new issue, and because there's a kind of limited time, we have so many readers. I've decided I'm going to tell you a little fact about the journal uh, before each reader, and um, but. I'd like to thank all the readers. Some of them are newly published in the journal and have never been in it before, and many have been published several times over the years. So my first little fact is that supposedly there was a rumor, or maybe it's true, that the original editor, the original editor of the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, Cliff McIntyre, decided to have a journal because Pigpen from the Grateful Dead suggested that he do this because there are so many creative people in the Haight-Ashbury. Now the first reader that's going to read is Cesar Love, who is also an editor of the journal. Okay, thank you, Alice, and thanks everybody for getting here on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I've been an editor with the journal, I think maybe 10 years. I think Alice um, asked me to help them out and it's been really fun. It's been a privilege to get to share this role, play this role of Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal. I, I never met Cliff McIntyre, I wish I had. Um, somehow our paths never crossed, but hoping that um, he's here and he's proud of us continuing on um, the magazine that he started. So um, I'm going to read a few poems. This is from a, a previously published in the journal, not in the recent one, but it's called Donut Shop. I, I, I don't like donuts, but I really like donut shops. <laughs> so Donut Shop. Most customers order theirs to go. The glazed, the old-fashioned, the maple bars. They take theirs in small white bags or in big pink boxes. Then there are the ones who order 
for here. The ones who nest at the counter or sit beside the window, their daydreams floating like buttermilk bars and memories uncurling like cinnamon rolls. Their amusements twirl, their ideas fancy as French twists. Flavorsome steam ascends from the coffee pots, dark roast, Kona, and hazel. Refills on the house. Uh, so I'm going to read from this issue. Uh, this poem is called Flower Bed of Black. The sun hides, the street lights glow. I put on my jewelry. I put on my shine shoes. So much becomes in the dark. So much becomes under the neon. Dance moves, laughter, lovers. Oh, playground of night. Oh, flower bed of black. I take off my rings. I take off my heels. And Okay, so I'm going to read one more poem. This one's called Still Lost. Today, I found my jacket. It had fallen from a hanger in my closet. Yesterday, I found my glasses. They were spread on my kitchen table. The day before, I found the overdue library book. It had dropped behind my bookshelf. The day before, the day before, I found my keys. They were lolling below my desk. Still lost, the lyrics to that song. Maybe they lie on the floor of my closet. Still lost, my philosophy. Maybe it sprawled on my kitchen table. Still lost, my train of thought. Maybe it hides behind my bookshelf. Still lost, my way. Maybe it lurks below my desk. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to hand the mic back to Alice, who is running this train. The Haight Ashbury Literary Journal really got going because. Indigo or Joanne Hotchkiss and Cliff McIntyre had a group of people that met at their apartment on Oak Street and they started uh, finding writers to be in the issue. Now, um, the next reader is Dan Richman. Howdy do. Nice to see you all. Uh, well, uh, it's almost May, isn't it? And so I happen to have a poem in this book of mine titled, coincidentally, May. So here it is. <clears throat> In May, my old grandma would lumber through the garden, rich with wet lilacs, silk, lilies, crucified dogwood blossoms. The whole, the white cat, you know, I don't have enough light here. So you'll have to forgive me if I stumble. Um, <clears throat> Oh, uh, 
Oh, well. You tried. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <clears throat> Through the garden, rich with wet lilies, silk lilacs, crucified dogwood blossoms, the white cat mincing behind, his tail erect, stick-like, and I would come trotting to keep up, stunned by the perfume of Earth's breath, and also saddened by it, even crushed. Everyone else, ood and odd over blossoms, mom and the wide ants in their floral dresses, <clears throat> they would all Uh, they would all lean low and inhale the sacred scent while emitting small cries, while I stood aside in great confusion since pain was mixed with perfume, as if I had stupidly grabbed hard a stem of roses, inhaling heaven with a bleeding hand, as if I already knew that beauty is thin, that joy is transitory, that ever waiting is the world with its smoke and broken glass. Puritans and savages. <clears throat> the derelict extended his styrofoam cup into the stream of people who sometimes dropped in a coin and once in a while a green buck. But when the crowd thinned, he fished around in the dark, dirty drapery to palm a cigarette. He lit it. The smoke for a moment obscuring him, the way fog can temporarily hug a gnarled tree. Otherwise, he kept the hot ciggy between his knees. <clears throat> the Puritans must not think they are paying for his smokes. Granola, yes, and fruits, and leafy vegetables, and, and seeds, and nuts. But tobacco? The devil dresses in it, washes with it, injects the death into it. But don't they see these citizens, though they might have hearts like bouquets of daisies? Tobacco is the sole caress he has left. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And that just reminded me that the journal at one point had a contest for homeless writers, and the prize was books from uh, the anarchist bookstore bound together. And the next writer is John Rowe.
Greetings, everyone. Uh, I traveled from the East Bay, El Cerrito, to be with you this afternoon, so it's great to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Alice and uh, Cesar, the editors, for including two of my poems in the current issue. Um, I'll read those two and then follow up with a, uh, a new poem. Upon arrival here, here we are, if there was ever a doubt, we'd be right here when we arrived. Though what of this silence where we simply make eye contact and the roarless lion-shaped cloud drifts with time, covering then uncovering the sun. Somewhere is a place in walking distance or farther across the globe or universe, public or private, a place to visit in dreams. Close your eyes and you're suddenly somewhere. Somewhere wants to be named and it's your job to name it. Somewhere doesn't need a government or rules. Somewhere will flash you back to a simpler time. You will experience deja vu on an hourly basis. Strangers will recognize you and call you by new names. I helped a friend get somewhere once, and he helped me too. Do you know where home is? If you don't, get to somewhere you'd like to call home and call it home. And this is my new poem, not in, the, not in the journal, not published anywhere. The Lost Man. In between rains, he takes to walking the clean paved streets, as well as the muddy roads. He feels in a hurry, but doesn't know where he is going. In the shadows, he investigates sparks of light. In the storefront windows, he examines reflections, including his own. He can't be too sure if businesses are about to open or have just closed. He can't be too sure about anything. He walks and walks the squares of his town, and he bumps into himself on circular paths. He also bumps into street lamp posts and sign poles saying, excuse me a lot. He takes sit-down rests on wet bus stop and park benches. He disagrees with himself. Inner voice says, you're lonely. He counters with, no, I'm just alone. Defiantly sticking out his tongue, he begins to remember something, knows he cannot hitch a ride to paradise, knows that it takes time to recover from a hard fall. He breathes deeply in and out. It will soon rain again. He remains calm, closes his eyes, envisions the growing back of feathers and wings. Thank you. Cliff McIntyre had been incarcerated, and one of the other editors was John Meehan, who started the Haight-Ashbury Soup Kitchen. He also worked for the Rebound program at San Francisco State, which uh, had uh, former prisoners uh, going back to school. And at some point, uh, the PEN America program contacted the journal, and we often get submissions from prisoners. And uh, in our current issue, we have a whole section of people and their point of view. And the next writer is uh, Karen Melander Magoon. Thank you, and thank you so much, um, Hate Ashbury, for publishing my poems. And I, I, the last poet I just found very interesting. First of all, there were two, two little uh, phrases that really struck me. One, when he was walking around, often bumping into himself. Uh -huh. I love that phrase. And the a very end, sitting there, growing back feathers. I love that, too. So. Um, I'm going to read two poems from 
the wonderful, most current Haight-Ashbury journal. And then I am going to read another poem from someone else in the journal. I'm not sure which one, but I'm going to pick one poem from the journal from someone who's far away and would not be here tonight. Space. Space between fingers. Space between leaves. Or the petals of a rose scalloped across the sky. Space between notes, allowing music to happen. Space between friends. Space between moments. Between here and there, now and yesterday. Space as an idea of nothing. Space as an idea of everything. Unsaid or undone. Space traveled on a path curling towards the space at the top of a hill, or space between needles of grass softly pillowing my body and the body of my tiny baby years ago as we looked up at the space of the sky, the space between clouds, and I imagined us both floating within that space, resting on clouds, dissipating in space holding on in that same space together. Thank you. And this uh, poem I actually wrote as a, as a song. And originally I wrote it for Palestinians, but I wound up putting it in my musical portrait of Clara Barton, who was the uh, instigator and founder of the American Red Cross. And my whole portrait of her was devoted to her um, antipathy towards war and so many songs about people who are victims of war. And, and I felt, because she wound up actually uh, working for the, the bureau at the end, the Census Bureau, whatever, to, to join families together at the end of the Civil War. And so I felt this poem was quite appropriate, called, This is the Key to My House. This is the key to my house, worn by my pocket and my hand, through the turning of a century, no turning of a key. This is the key to my home, hung on the door many yesterdays ago, forced by a war to roam. From the village of my youth, a reminder of the truth of my home. This is the key to my house. Now I can see the door. But time has changed the name. The family's not the same. The key may never turn again. This is the key to my house. Why do I hold it in my hand? The past has disappeared with the morning of the years all lost in the seas of time. My house looks out to me, saying, come and set me free. Plant the roses by the stair, light the fireplace, and share all the stories that you know with me. But I turn and look away, knowing I may never stay in the home where I would be once again. This is the key to my house. And the last poem is just right here under that poem, and it's called Beneath an Overpass. And it was written by George Lonnecker from Middlesex, Vermont. Now, if you're here today, I won't dare to read your poem, but I'm assuming you are not. Beneath an Overpass. 
The train to Seattle passes blue and yellow tents and tarps in gray and near the waterline, farther along, near crisscrossed overpasses downtown on the edge of Puget Sound, within sight of a marvelous microbrew cafe. People camp on tarps, pallets, cardboard boxes, and in tents next to the railroad tracks. These aren't campgrounds like the state parks along Puget Sound. This is the last refuge of America's refuse, a city's cast-offs, the same city as the Space Needle, Microsoft, Starbucks, and bright lights of Pike Place Market. All through November, cold rain starts and stops, drops off bridges. A woman huddled on a damp tarp lights a candle, remembers being a girl in her warm bed. She eats a stale muffin. Later, she'll line up for a free meal. She tries to sleep while trains pass. Cars and trucks rumble overhead in fog. A ferry crosses to Vashon Island. Lights on already at four. Um, I would like to make a quick comment about that last one. Just as with the poem about this is the key to my house, it seems to have a very global intent. And uh, this, of course, I actually, my first nine years were spent in Seattle, so I found this um, kind of coming home. But coming home at a, in a different era, the era of homelessness. And of course, we experience it here, and it seems to be a global phenomenon. So I felt that was very appropriate. Not the tents for the people who are on vacation, but the tents along the road full of dust. So thank you very much. Well, now that the editors had a journal, they had the problem of uh, how to distribute it or sell it or what to do with it. Um, one of the issues uh, had 6,000 copies, and Joanne Hotchkiss took it to the Rainbow Gathering to give away for free. But then we got a, a, a vendor named Bird, or William Birdwood, who was homeless. Unfortunately, he died recently. But he managed to go on Haight Street and other places, sometimes Berkeley or Santa Cruz, and he would read poems from the journal. And he was quite a performer also. And he probably saved the journal, at least for a while. And our next reader is Nellie Wong. It's great to see everyone here. I see Ed and others that um, I've met, and some of you I haven't. But it's really, really neat to be here um, at the library and reading from the Hate ashbury Journal. And thank you very much, Alice and other editors, for uh, including my work. Two days from now, April 30th, will be an anniversary of my father's migration to Oakland, California. I'm an Oakland girl, and four of my siblings, four siblings born in Oakland, with a different name from my father because he had to buy papers to bring my mother over because under the, ex uh, under the exclusion law, of 1882, Chinese men could not bring their wives to the United States. So I'm just chilling because I can't believe how long it's been that the family started here in the Bay Area. This is called When You Have Forgotten. When you have forgotten the paper dreams beneath the banyan tree, the peanut oil wafting out the rice field, your father's brush strokes feathering across the page, your grandparents sorting greens and flinging bugs, 
when you have forgotten land yielding crops, when the land held back and hunger roared, ocean's arms welcoming the goddess of mercy, when courage and goal flickered in your young eyes, your coal black hair, you cross the ocean when you have forgotten fingering yam, diokor, and lotus nuts, measuring with precision tiger lily and southern almonds for soup to clear lung congestion, you turn to the abacus and remember. So when my dad first traveled here as a 17-year-old, he went to work in an herb store in Oakland, Chinatown that was um, owned, I think, by my granduncle. So I think also in light of the um, COVID pandemic and when the anti-Asian racism really was just furious that so many of us I know needed to say, let's tell our stories about who we are, who we were, why we came, and that Racism is not black and white. Not that, you know, the slavery and the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II and what has happened from the uh, exclusion law of 1882 has a tremendous effect on what life is like for people of color and especially, I think, in talking about um, Chinese and other Asian Pacific Americans. This one is an old one. Some of you may know it, but I wanted to just connect it to my father coming here um, in 1912 and making four trips. And then half the family is named G, and the four youngest ones, beginning with me, are Wong. So when people ask me, are you really a Wong? I said, no, I'm not. So this is called is in the blood. We never asked to be mysterious. We never asked to be inscrutable, still untold stories, untold histories, retrieved burnt letters, receipts, bills, anything written, anything spoken, our dreams in bones and ashes, to be seen and heard, to be known, but not merely by our many names. Being presumptuous, I speak for myself. Others who remain silent own their own tongues. Lai Hong's mama died when Lai Hong was an infant. Ma said that Lai Hong's mama was a little crazy. The villager said so. Lai Hong likes to eat chicken feet. Lai Hong smiles, a child woman. Lai Hong loves babies. Lai Hong is my sister. Lai King remembers Angel Island, the bright lights of Oakland and San Francisco. She said that Baba sent fruit and candy to cheer them up behind bars. They were lucky imprisoned on Angel Island only four days. The other immigrants waved goodbye. Some etched poems into the walls. Lai King learned to eat cheese and tomatoes on the President Hoover. To this day, Lai King cannot stomach butter or milk. Lai King is my sister. Lai Wa remembers the ship. She was three years old. The immigration officer asked her, what is your name? Lai Wa answered, if you don't tell me yours, I won't tell you mine. Lai Wa smiled behind straight bangs. Lai Wa remembers nothing of her years in China. Lai Wa is my sister. Sel Hong Ji is my father. Sui Ting Yi Ji is my mother. From 1933 to 1965, Sui Ting Ji was known as Theo Kui Ji, a sister's name, a sister's paper, that Baba bought to bring his wife and daughters over. Theo Kui Ji was supposed to be my father's sister, my sister's aunt. This was 1933. In 1924, the law said that Chinese men could bring no wives to the United States. Theo Kui Ji was unmarried, but we knew better. 
Nellie Wong is my name. I was never Nellie G, but we knew better. When my sister's aunt, that is, Theo Quiji, my mother, got pregnant, to bear a child out of wedlock was out of the question. So Theo Quiji got married by faking a marriage certificate by marrying a man named Sheng Wong, who agreed to appear on paper to be my father. Shame to the outside world avoided. Secrets depending on which side of the fence. When I was five and entered Chinese school, Lai Oi became my Chinese name. Leslie Wong was born after me. Ay ya, that was another girl. That was my mother's wail. Ma and Baba named Leslie Lai Ging. Her nickname was Tlam Gong An, Three Corner Eye. Leslie Wong is my sister. Florence Wong was born after Leslie. Ay, ya, another girl. That was my mother's wail. So no more lies, so no more daughters with Chinese names, beginning with Lai, beginning with beautiful. So Florence was named Ling Oi to change my mother's luck. Florence Wong is my sister. William Wong was born after Florence. Finally, a boy, that was Ma's and Baba's joy. Thankful their daughter, Ling Oi, brought them their son. Baba gave a month-old party to shave William's head. Eggs were dyed red. Friends and relatives filled the house. We drank chicken whiskey, gnawed vinegar, pig's feet. Ling Oi was the magic that Ma and Baba decided to beget a son to beget a son to love. And the heavens answered, Wakang is William Wong's Chinese name. William Wong is my brother. I was never sure who I really was. My school records showed that I was Nellie Wong, that my father and Leslie's father and Florence's father and William's father was a man named Xing Wong. We told no lies, only the truth, as we were forced to. My three older sisters were supposed to be my cousins. My father was supposed to be my uncle. My mother was supposed to be my father's sister. When Theo Quiji confessed her illegal status, she became Sui Ting Ji, my father's legal wife. But it was too late. Baba died in 1961. Now I use the name Nellie Wong. Now I search for all the names that gave me life. Thank you. And to uh, round out my um, reading for today, um, this was written just a couple years ago, but it's called Two Adult Tickets, Please. Two Adult Tickets, Please, says my baba in his jacket and pressed trouser, laying a dollar bill on the counter. He and Mama, each holding me at five years, my sisters at three and a half, uncomprehending, glancing toward the man suited in dark blue in a glass cage. You children, you cannot enter the theater. They will cry, make a fuss, disturb our patrons, the man's voice crisp and cold. The man pushes the dollar bill back toward Baba's hand. No, no, Mama cries out. Good girls, they not cry. Baba joins Mama's plea. We hold them on our laps. If they make noise, we leave, okay? You promise? The man in dark blue pulls two tickets, slides them out with two quarters in change through the opening of the glass cage. You bet, Baba grins, his right thumb up. Holla, holla, mama sings. Moto, guai nui, okay? No noise, good girls. 
Leslie and I hold hands, glide into the Paramount Theater, uptown, settle in our parents' laps, watch Gone with the Wind, our eyes fixed on the silver screen. Thank you. Well, over the years, a journal has had many uh, amazing writers. It's been wonderful to be able to work and communicate with them. Some of them uh, became poet laureates. Uh, Jack Hirschman was one of the earlier features, became poet laureate of the city. And Lee Herrick is now poet laureate of California. And he was one of our feature writers also. And the next. The next reader is Raphael Pineda. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to Alice and to Cesar, and thank you to the library for the opportunity of being here. It's a great honor to be a part of the journal. Uh, so I wanted to dedicate the reading of this poem. Oh. Oh, just give you a little more mic. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Cesar. Wanted to dedicate the reading of this poem to my wife, Katya, who is here. Uh, it's a poem from the current uh, issue called, uh, poems called Our Time. I sit outside as the morning sunlight is taken by a tall tree. Around me, the cold and the rows of sleeping fireflies on rooftops and windowsills awaiting nightfall to signal cheer are the only markers of the new season. Another day has started with the same smell of dark coffee, yet now I have seen myself enveloped in your green iris, and I have granted you free passage into my eyes. I have seen how your eyes can contain me, and they could never be contained in a poem. Hasn't it always been autumn? Time produced change out of sight. As still as we seemed, we were moving so light could shine differently on us. You ask me to take care of your garden. I'm no good with plants, you say. I tell you the truth. It will be the first garden I plant, but I'll make sure it faces the sun. <laughs> Thank you. One of the most fun things the journal did was Circo Poetico, where we combined with a, a circus, and uh, it was a fundraising idea, but it, it was great. It was a, a group that lived in the Excelsior and uh, all worked together on circus acts, and somehow we got um, together with them. I think one of them was the niece of uh, Claude Palmer, who was also a poet. And our next poet is Antoinette Vela Payne. Wow, what a wonderful event. Thank you, Alice and Cesar, for publishing my poems in the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal. Thank you, the library, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to read uh, three poems, and uh, two of them have been published in the, uh, the Ashbury, um, Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal. Uh, this one is in the most recent. It's called New November for an Old Soul. The leaves are bright, changing colors, rust to red, letting go, leaning into what's next, moving on to what serves them now in this new November. Apple orchard smells sweet, carved pumpkins sit on front steps, and like the fall leaves fluttering to the ground, I am falling into myself this November hour of my life, looking for sustenance of spirit in kindness and connection, the part of me that looks like you, different yet the same. 
reconnoitering the landscape of your body, falling into the curve and crevice of your smile, brighter than the sun, fluid as time lapsed over eons. I literally have to look into your eyes, cool like chill November, as you pretend not to know me. I am the second full moon. Call me blue, blessing you with renewal, pulsing towards possibility. Look at me this November night. Feel my rays on your face. Contemplate my rare return. Take a moon bath. Look up. And then this is another one that was uh, published in a previous edition called Stardust. Winter's darkness falls asunder. Spring brings in the light. Ishtar's ancient name resides in me without ignorance or ego. I am determined to see, obeying no laws save nature and change. My eyes do not see the light. I am not a body, but what am I? Love and light essentially joined in spirit housed in flesh. Everything trimmed in light glitters away the dark, shows what's hidden yet always there. Compassion and strength, subtle shimmer, radiates in my voice, my stance and stride. Curiosity brings worldly gifts, melons and grapes, sweet sizzling summers, rites of spring. When the wind breaks open the sky, wide, open, wide, where nothing stops the light, you and I as co-conspirators hold this dream to bellow out under our flaming, fortuitous fraction of time, detonated at birth. We are exploding stars. Thank you. And then I'm going to read one last one that is kind of my new endeavor. It's called Cruising Around the Bay. Started out in a 1953 red Chevy Bel Air bought from my brother's friend for the $500 in 1969 with red vinyl seats. It probably died, so my dad helped me buy a 1965 teal blue black canvas convertible top Ford Mustang, a collector's classic now. My cousin drank my dad's scotch one day, drove my car into a light pole. She was underage, so I took the blame, grateful my parents cared only that I was okay. Dad traded that classy pony car at Rico Gallardi's used car lot for a 1973 mustard yellow Ford Pinto. Rico knew what he was doing. Dad said it looked like a jewel in the parking lot on a misty night after seeing Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte at the movies. That yellow Pinto took me through my pot-hazed LSD bell-bottom 20s on my own, wild and carefree. I worked at AT&T, cried when the Vietnam War ended. Maroon Camaro with removable roof was next. Dark, tinted, T-top, oversized gangster tires. Hippy dippy me selling radio time in the city, cruising to Dylan's lay, lady lay on the radio. Had a baby girl in 81, still driving that open-air Camaro until I bought a new beige Renault with fancy gold rim wire wheels to drop her off at daycare. It was a lemon. All downhill from there to a Mazda stick shift, had to learn how to drive it off the lot, worked at KRML in Carmel where they filmed Play Misty for me and I met Clint Eastwood. Early 90s, I got an 81 brown Mercedes with classic front grille to help me sell real estate, then replaced it with a newer 87 blue Mercedes, plastic interior dashboard looked like a glorified Honda. Then a white 2001 Acura propelled me through the housing bubble and forced foreclosures, driving that decade along California's coast, listening to Santana's smooth. Now I ride a gray 214 Honda Civic, depreciating like the rest. I love the rear view camera on the dash, looking backward through time. Right foot on the pedal provides independence for women on their own, yet greenhouse emissions from carbon dioxide demand that we take another road. Thank you very much.
the journal went through a phase of having themes on the issues. We had love and erotic. We had uh, work. We had uh, a peace issue. The peace issue was right before the Iraq war started. And we had one issue that was featuring Bill Shields, who is a Vietnam veteran. And our next reader is Ed Maiku. Thanks to the Hay Street and to the journal and to the people on it and my family who lived there and uh, I lived there and my sisters lived there and my mother lived there <laughs> and nieces and nephews and this is a short, mo I'm a lyric poet, that means short. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Richard, hi. Yeah, the great wave. This is bitter. Life is brief. Friendships passing. Time's the thief. Life is bitter. This is brief. Passing friendships surpassed by grief. Time is liquid. Each sun sets and sunset renews our floating leaf. The next, another one is, I, I told you they were short. <laughs> we leave nothing, we leave nothing, nothing behind. What we experience, we are. Much passes through us, we leave nothing behind. What we are, we are. Oh, what we have been is us. What is left is nothing. We leave nothing behind. An earthworm caught in time, much passes through us. What we have been, we were. What is left is nothing. We leave nothing behind. And a next, another shorty, hi Dave, <laughs> uh, is called the early grape. We are the early grape, flat, dry, and cloudy, the time is short, but some days never end. There is no joyous lake, there is no incantation that can bend the moment back into the patterns we may see too late. Wait for tomorrow, tomorrow never ends. Wait for tomorrow, tomorrow never ends. Three is a crowd, the spunky ones, the cream in your coffee, I know. I know, I know, I know, we said that. That's the thing, do it, do it now. Early wine is flat, dry, and cloudy, and some days never, never end. And there is no joyous lake. There is no incantation that will bend the moment back into the patterns we have seen too late. Thank you. I do have a longer poems, but uh, these poems work very well for uh, a public group. The, jur oh. the journal also has art, and uh, we usually use black and white drawings and uh, Recently, we've had an artist named Elaine Gerard and also her sister, Lisa Gerard, and they're from, uh, originally from Montana. They're uh, Blackfoot uh, natives, and a lot of their art uh, shows that. And our, our next reader is Claudia Portillo, and uh, I think she's going to do something with the cello as well. Oh. But she's reading the poems of Eva Helene Stern.
<coughs> Hello. Eva and I are friends. She, um, she couldn't be here today, and that is why I am doing a solo collaboration. So I have to get some things ready here. Okay, so Eva would like to share. Warm greetings from Graz, Austria, and with gratitude to Alice Rogoff and Cesar Love from the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, and a big thank you to Claudia Portillo for reading my poems in the San Francisco Main Public Library on National Poet Day in the US. This is a big joy and honor to me. I wrote those poems while I was traveling back and forth from California to Austria between 2022 and 2023 to support a very dear friend of mine and to broaden my own horizon of life. Together with my dear friends, artistic friends, we built an, an intercontinental, unchanging bridge of courage and peace. Best wishes to each of you today in the San Francisco Main Public Library. Eva Helen Stern. So that's that. I am the cellist with no cello, so I have recordings. Okay. Repeal time, multidimensional from the innermost turned inside out. Repealed structure, a new perception. A flow of constant renewal because we shape one big life. I speak out those eternal names, those promises of time beyond distortions of fear. the bursting space, and I stand in the middle of shiny, swirling, recreating eternities. And I spin, I spiral, arms spread wide open in the midst of a rain of shards. The shards laid like scales on my body, a new skin made of bursted imagination, made of open space. In the river of eternities, I lay my skin, my skins, over planets, universes, eons, my infinite being. In pulsating waves of wisdom. Okay. I understand. Yes, she has been published in the Literary Journal. She is a visual artist as well. We've been on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, so these are her poems, and the execution is all my idea. Um, but here we go. This one is called Mother. These two poems were written in San Francisco, by the way. <coughs> Ironically, <coughs> no. <coughs> she wrote this on the first invasion, um, anniversary of the invasion into Ukraine, 2023. Oh, wrong. Mother. Mother. Mystery of our existence. Mystery of our existence. I see you stumble. I see you stumble. I see you in pain. I see you in pain. 
I see you dance. I see you dance. You are a glow from eternity. You are a glow from eternity. Amidst the destruction. Amidst the destruction. We are undeniable. Undeniable. Mystery. Mystery. Force. Force of, of life. life. So that was our do it. The last, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This last poem will be recited by Eva by herself. And, um, and I wonder, maybe, right? At the conclusion, you may join me in some movement. Uh, she, she's also a, a dancer and, well, and, and who isn't? If you're alive, you move, hopefully, right? If you can't, it's okay. So the last poem. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be juggling here. Third poem I wrote in Austria at the River Moor. I grasp, capture, embody the correlations. I am a sparkling miracle like you, like all, Living. leaving no trace but contribute to the collective trace. Moving together in good directions. Now, today, here. So I'm gonna... the journal in uh, 1984, so it would, had been going for uh, four years before that, and Indigo, or Joanne, lived to 90. She passed away recently, and she was the editor, like, all that time. Uh, Cliff, unfortunately, died fairly soon, but she kept it going, and so our recent issue is dedicated to her. But this is a poem by myself that's in the, that's in the journal. It's called Corona Subconscious. When I was a teenager going barefoot into our cold basement, I remember my father was so mad at me for going barefoot it didn't seem so serious. I could get sick, he said. Now this early May, as I walk through the woods with a mask, thinking about his birthday, May 16th, 1910. In 1913, his little brother died of spinal meningitis before penicillin. Some walkers without mask are walking not at a distance, 
I thought of Dad's anger. He was a businessman encountering a fresh flower child, perhaps. But now I think it touched off something in him, like the dark inside of an old tree. What was it that went wrong? They both were so little that a small child could disappear without a trace before he even really knew his little brother, before they could play together in the sun and snow. And, let's see. This one is called After the Park Branch Library Poetry Reading. After the Park Branch Library Poetry Reading, the late night Haight-Ashbury is still full of music, poles covered with posters forming a tapestry. Fog covers the windows and it feels like the moors, a tree scraping a third floor window. Bird, the poetry magazine street vendor, settles on a bench for the night. I hear the bells on this side of town. They are sea bells come from the bay, ringing into the land. The death of the summer of love was declared many years ago. Some might interpret the bells as funereal. I look at the last poems I read and changed two words. Two lovers are kissing goodnight on a corner. The last bus disappears to the station, waiting to come back again. And thank you, everyone. There are former issues of the journal on exhibit, and there are also newer issues that you're welcome to take one. And there's a few books for sale also by Cesar and myself. And Nellie is going to Nellie Wong is going to make an announcement. I should have done it earlier. Thank you. Uh, when I was um, reading my pieces, um, I, sh I should have. Uh, I want you to know actually that uh, my brother William G. Wong Bill uh, has come out with a new memoir called Sons of Chinatown, a memoir wrote, rooted in China and America. It's newly out from uh, Temple University Press, and um, there was a, a book launch over at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center in Chinatown in Oakland, and he was blown away because 200 people came. So I hope that you'll look for it, and you'll get a deeper look into the story of one Chinese-American family, but what's really neat about the book is that Bill is a retired journalist, and he also talks about being a journalism, um, actually kind of known as the Dean of Asian American Journalism, but uh, it's, it's something we're really proud of, and I hope that you will look for it. Thank you.